And at the same time, um, we're going to be live streaming on the phone. We're going to be um, Facebook. Yeah, Facebook as well. So we're going to live stream on the phone. We're going to be on Facebook as well. And uh, yeah, that's how that's how this is going to flow. So um, <clears throat> we're making sure we cover it today. All right. I'm sorry we're not doing the regular format that we would normally do. Um, this is the first time that we are doing this, so we're gonna it's gonna be shaky right now. Tonight we are doing uh, Ezekiel chapter 16. I know we did it last week, but we're doing it again um, because last week, as you all recall, we had all kinds of issues, so we're going to be doing it again uh, today. So. Yeah, that's how we're going to do this. We're going to start the stream. We're going to start recording. So we are recording now and we are live now. Um, well, the Facebook, of course, has stopped, but yeah, we're going to try that again. Hold on, bear with me. Bear with me, family. We're getting ready to get started here in just a second. I just want to make sure that we have everything in order. Praise the Most High. And uh, we're recording, and hopefully everything works. And we'll see. I'm going to stop the stream here so we can do it in Facebook. And copy here and actually we did this already so hold on let's see if we can see if we can go live here <clears throat> all right i think we we are going live All right, we're gonna we're figuring this out. Praise the Most High. Yeah, we know this now. We're figuring this out. Figuring it out. Figuring it out, brother. Okay, so I cannot see you guys on Pal Talk. I can't see you at all. Uh, Bathamon, if there's a problem, um, you know you can text me, and maybe I'll see the text. <laughs> <laughs> but right now we are, because um, I, I got my, uh, uh, I am um, in another form, trying to do this in another form. Um, and it's giving me a hard time. Hold on. I got an idea. All right, um, we're going to have to, I'm not going to do the Facebook because that one's giving me a hard time. So we're going to stick with what we have here. I'm going to see if I could start streaming. It's just stopping recording at this point for a second, but I'm just going to continue. Yeah, I'm using my phone. I'm using my phone and then I'm going to upload the video from my phone to um to YouTube. That's what I, and I you know, we practiced it once and it worked, so I'm going to upload the video from my phone to YouTube and then we're going to test it from there and see if it if it worked out properly. If that's the case, then we're all set. We can just continue to do that. Yeah, so that that's how we're going to do this going forward here. That's how we're going to do this. And um, hopefully this this will work. I think, well, it, and pr we practiced and it did work in practice, but 
let's see what happens as we are now doing it live. But we're going to do Ezekiel chapter 16 again. And um, just give me a minute here. I just want to check this Facebook thing one more time. Make sure that we're all set there. And uh, we're going to be getting started in a moment. Yeah, we're just uh, trying to figure out various ways of doing this. <laughs> and uh, like I said, we're going to go to the 16th uh, of Ezekiel, the 16th chapter of Ezekiel again. But... Um, Let's start uh, with this recording thing here. Changes there and have the camera and I'm going to start recording, start streaming, and we're going to do this here. Okay. All right, um, all right, brethren, let's get started. Let's get started. We are studying Ezekiel, and we left off, we did study Ezekiel chapter 16 last week, but uh, because of all of the confusion and all the stuff that was going on with it, um, I wanted to do it again this week and be able to upload it into the YouTube library with all the other videos that we have. We did do Ezekiel 14 and 15. The last recorded thing that we did was Ezekiel 14 and 15. We did that together. It was all under Ezekiel chapter 14 but because 15 was a shortened chapter. So as normal, let's start um, as we normally do with some backdrop. First off, I just want to reiterate a few things uh, as we get started here. I want to reiterate a few things. The first thing I want to bring forth is, and by the way, can I just get a one if you guys can hear me testing one, two, three? Um, there is no Hangouts at this point, so we don't have Hangouts available, um, and I apologize for that. So there won't be an address for Hangouts, not at this time, but maybe we'll work something out. I'm trying to work with that to see if I can still get it anyway, but... Um, for now, there's no hangouts. Um, but let me reiterate. Ezekiel is a prophet, an Israelite, as are all the prophets of the Bible. All the prophets of the Bible are Israelites. There is no other nation represented among the 40 prophets of the Bible. They're all Israelites. Okay? They're all Hebrew Israelites. And just for uh, clarification, I want to make sure we can make sure we're clear on what it means as an Hebrew Israelite. Um, let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 11. And let's look and see about Hebrew Israelites. First off, uh, the word Israelite is very easy um, in, in terms of Israelite. We know that Israel is the name that was given to Jacob. This name was given to Jacob by the Most High. His name was Jacob or Ya'akob, but his name was changed to Yasha'al. Yasha'al is the Hebrew word to say, the way you say Israel in ancient Hebrew is Yasha'al because it is made up of two, um, two pieces. Yashar, which means to be right with, and Al, which is short for the Most High. So Yasha Al means right with the Most High. Yasha Al, right with the Most High. And in Genesis chapter 32, we can see Genesis chapter 32. 
we know the story. Yaakov or Jacob is wrestling with an angel. He's wrestling actually with the angel of the covenant who is the Messiah. He's, re he's, he's wrestling with him. And how do we know his Messiah? Well, I can tell you that in a moment. Uh, but first, in I, Genesis chapter 32, let's take it up uh, from verse 24 down to verse, from verse 24 down to verse 28. Actually, 24 to, tw to 30, because that'll help explain the whole Yahawashai as well. So let's take a look. Uh, Genesis tw uh, 32 from verse 24 down to verse 30. And Yaakov was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Yaakov's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Yaakov. And he said, Thy name shall be no more, shall be called no more, Yaakov. But Yashar Al, for as a prince hast thou power with Yah and with men, and hast prevailed. And Yaakov asked him and said, Tell, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it thou, thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Yaakov called the name of the place Panael, for I have seen the face of Yah, fa I have seen Yah face to face, and my life is preserved. So he said, He looked in the face of the Most High. That he was wrestling with the Most High. But the Bible tells us in the Gospel of John that no man have seen Yah at any time. That the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So any time somebody physically says that they saw the Father, I and mean, it wasn't a vision, it wasn't a, a dream, it wasn't a prophecy like that. It was, it was the Messiah they actually were seeing. So here, he's actually wrestling. He's putting hands, he's laying, he's got hands on the Messiah. Okay, and he's wrestling, and his name was changed from ja Yaakov or Jacob to Yashar Al. So every party he's now named Israel. So everybody that's of his lineage is an Israelite. Does that make sense? Testing one, two, three. Everybody follow me so far. Everybody follow me. So, uh, uh, so if 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 you're of the lineage of Yaakov, whose name was changed to Yashar Al or Israel, then you are. By definition, because he's your, he's your progenitor, you are an Israelite. Okay, so now let's go back to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10, and we know that Yaakov or Jacob came, he was of the son of Yaasik, or Isaac, Yishak, Yishak, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm all messed up today, Yishak. Or Isaac. Jacob was the son of Isaac. Isaac was the son of Abraham. Abraham is the descendant of Shem, who is the oldest son of Noah. Shem, Ham, Yafet. So Shem um, had children, and one of those children was named Arphaxad. Let's take a look at that. This is Arphaxad, Genesis chapter... Let's go with Genesis chapter 10... Genesis chapter 10, and I'm going to begin at verse 21. Genesis chapter 10, verse 21 and 22. Genesis 10, 21 and 22. Notice what it says. Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, to him were children born. The children of Shem, Elam, Ashur, Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. So now you see Shem had one, two, three, four, five sons. And one of those sons is Arphaxad. <clears throat> so now the Bible is going to give you Arphaxad's children. So let's go down to verse 24, same chapter 10 of Genesis. And let's go down to verse 24. And notice what it says in verse 24. All right, and let's go from verse 24. Uh, yeah, let's just read verse 24 for now. Verse 24. Notice what it says. Our facts have begot Shalah, and Shalah begot Eber. Now, Eber is where we get the word Hebrew. 
It comes from right there, from Eber. If you look up Eber, it's where the origin of the word Hebrew is from Eber. Okay? Everybody following me so far? So Eber is a descendant of Shem. He's a Shemite. And Eber ended up being the father, a, a progenitor of Abraham. So Abraham, they called him the Hebrew. Abraham the Hebrew because he came from Eber, who was the Hebrew. Okay? So now, Abraham has Isaac. Isaac is also a Hebrew. Because he came from Abraham, who was a Hebrew. Yashaak Yesh had a son named Yaakov, or Jacob, who became Israel. So now Jacob is a Hebrew. And because his name was changed to Israel, his children are not only Hebrew, but they are Israelites. Therefore, they are Hebrew Israelites. So if you are a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and especially Jacob, you are a Hebrew and you are a Israelite. That's where you become a Hebrew Israelite. This is done by blood because you would have to have become a Hebrew Israelite because you are of the bloodline of Jacob. That's how you become a Hebrew Israelite. Of course, Abraham was not an Israelite because there was no Israelite in existence. Isaac was not an Israelite because there was no Israelite in existence. But Jacob became an Israelite because his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. Therefore, he and all of his children are Israelites. And because they come from Eber, they're also Hebrew. Therefore, they are Hebrew Israelites. Does that make sense? Everybody following me? So that is why a, a Gentile can be grafted into the Israelite nation. But they're not Hebrew Israelites because you can only become a Hebrew Israelite by blood. Everybody, okay? All right? So a Hebrew Israelite is by blood. You can become an Israelite by faith. You can become an Israelite by receiving, wait a minute, the Hebrew Israelite Messiah. You can become an Israelite by receiving the Hebrew, because Messiah is a Hebrew and he is an Israelite. Therefore, he is an Hebrew Israelite. And we can prove this, of course, from the Bible, because we know Messiah is of the tribe of Judah. Judah is one of the sons of Jacob. Jacob is a Hebrew Israelite. Therefore, all of his children, all of his descendants Anybody of his bloodline is also Hebrew Israelites. So now, let's let me let me break it down a little further. Ishmael is the son of Abraham. Ishmael is a Hebrew. Even though he's the son of an Egyptian woman, he is also a Hebrew. But he is not an Israelite <laughs> because he was not of Jacob's seed. Only one that are the Israelites are of Jacob's seed. Everybody with me so far? So now you can see. There's a difference between the Hebrew Israelites and people that are Israelites by faith. Praise the Most High God. Okay. Now, to take this to, to where we're coming from. All the prophets of the Bible, from Moses... On, because Moses is, is credited with the first five books of the Bible, right? With the ones that we call Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He's credited with writing those from the inspiration of the Father's Spirit. From him, all the way through, your Zechariah, your Isaiah's, your, your, your Jeremiah's, your Zephaniah's, your, you know, uh, your, your, your uh, Ezekiel. And going forward, everybody is a Hebrew Israelite, because all the writers of the Bible came from the lineage of Jacob. Everybody got that? So all of the Israelite, all of the uh, uh, writers that were prophets, 
that were used to write the scriptures are Hebrew Israelites. The Most High never used a Gentile to write the scriptures. That is why, and I'm not trying to be nasty. I'm not. Honestly, I'm not. But that is why as Hebrew Israelites, we can receive no other book as a holy book. But this book. Because this book was written through the prophets who by the Most High are Hebrew Israelites. We cannot receive a book that was supposed to be written by a man named Muhammad. We cannot receive that book because he is not an Israelite. He certainly is not a Hebrew Israelite. He might be a Semite because he's Arab. Or he was Arab, right? So he might have been a Semite, but he's not a Hebrew Israelite. He did not come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, he might have come from Abraham, but he didn't come from Jacob. He didn't come from the chosen seed of Isaac. Right? It was, the Bible says, in Isaac shall I see be called. So we can receive no, no other holy book because this is the book that was written by the Hebrew Israelite prophets. Now, there are some people looking at like Apocrypha, and I'm looking at it, and there's some books. And I can, I can justify them studying these books, even though I'm not still not completely sold on the Apocrypha. I'm reading it. I'm not denouncing it, but I'm saying I'm not completely sold. I'm studying it through. Um, the Bible says, lay hands on no man suddenly. In other words, don't endorse something quickly just because you feel good about it. I'm not sure about this apocrypha yet. I'm still studying it. But if it is authentic, it's got to be written by Hebrew Israelites. If it's going to be a holy book, it's got to be written by Hebrew Israelites. I know people are not going to like this, but the foundation and basis of everything that I'm saying to you is this King James Bible, which we are acknowledging is written by the Most High Yah, by His Spirit, to the Hebrew Israelites. Now, all the messages of the Scriptures are primarily given to Hebrew Israelites. All the messages of the Scriptures are primarily given to Hebrew Israelites. And that's why we're saying in these last days of earth's history where we dwell. The vessels that the Most High has declared he's going to use to bring forth his last message are the 12 tribes of the children of Israel recognized in the Bible as the 144,000 who are Hebrew Israelites. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. Hebrew Israelites. So that's why you, we can say confidently that they will be used to bring forth the message. And, and again, we, we want to also, you know, basically review and uh, understand that the initial gospel message was given by Hebrew Israelites, right? The initial gospel message, the apostle Paul, a Hebrew Israelite, all 12 of the apostles, Hebrew Israelites, and so they were given the call, the charge, the commission to bring the message of the gospel to all the earth. Well, they went first to the Hebrew Israelites to bring forth this message, and then they were commanded to also bring it by prophecy to the Gentile nations as well. So the Bible says to the Jew first. Also to the Greek. When it says the Jew, we're talking about the Hebrew Israelites. To them first and also to the Greek. It's because, and again, because as we saw in the scriptures, and let's read it, Exodus chapter 19. Let's take a look. Exodus, we're, we're, we're doing some backdrop before we get into Ezekiel chapter 16. But we're looking at Exodus chapter 19. Notice the command, the charge, the commission that the Holy Father, the true Holy Father, the only one Holy Father, who we call Yahweh, he is the only true Holy Father. There is no other. And he gave a charge to this particular group of people in Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19 Going to begin at verse 3, going to begin at verse 3, and going to go down to verse 6, Exodus 19, 3 through 6. Notice what it says, Exodus 19, 3 through 6. 
And Moses went up unto Yahweh. And Yahweh called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Yaakov, and tell the children of Israel. It's a conversation that the Most High is talking to the children of Israel through Moses, right? Notice that. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, or the Mizraim, and how I bare you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me. That is you Israelites, you descendants of Jacob, you Hebrew Israelites. Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. A kingdom of priests. Why would they need to be a kingdom of priests? Because the Most High has designed, as we have already saw, as we studied the first 15 verse uh, chapters already of Ezekiel, he had already set them in the midst of the nations to be an example, to be able to teach the nations about himself. They were appointed to be the people to instruct the nations about the true God. The only true God, the only living one ever is Yahweh, And they were instructed to teach the rest of the world about it. Of course, we know now they failed in that. The closest they came to it, the closest they came to it was in Solomon's kingdom. Because Solomon was blessed in terms of he was given rest, remember, from all his enemies. The Most High, because of David, blessed his son Solomon, and he was given rest. And the Bible says people were coming. Remember it said people were coming from all over the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Right? And Solomon was, was teaching them about the Most High Yah. And they were astonished at the things they were hearing about the Most High Yah. That was supposed to be the whole nation teaching the, the kingdom, all the kingdoms of the earth about the Most High Yah. Okay? But we failed in that. And the Most High, and that's one of the reasons we're looking at these prophets, is because we have studied and we understand that there's going to be a revival, a renewal, a restitution of of the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that in the book of Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 tells us that. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Ah, hmm. I'm, I'm, I always have trouble finding this verse. I'm going to find it though. Acts chapter 5. Hold on one second. Hmm. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Bear with me, brothers and sisters. Bear with me real quick. I ain't going to be looking for this all night. I'm going to find it quickly. Hold on. Bear with me. Hang on one second. Hang on. We're going to catch this right now. Uh, there it is. There it is. There it is. I'm sorry. It wasn't X5. It was X chapter 3. X chapter 3, verse 21. Notice again, X chapter 3. I'm going to start at verse 19 and go down to verse 21. X chapter 3 from 19 to 21. X chapter 3, 19 to 21. Notice what it says. Repent ye therefore and be converted. And of course, here the apostle is speaking to Hebrew Israelites. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of Messiah. And he shall send, I'm sorry, from the presence of Yahweh, excuse me. And he shall send Messiah Yahweh Shah, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which Yah have spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. 
talking about restitution of all things. That is, we're going to fulfill everything that was supposed to be done. From Garden of Eden with Adam all the way to nation of Israel, we're going to fulfill the word that the Most High has set in motion that we're supposed to fulfill. There's going to be a nation. There's going to be a city of Jerusalem. There's going to be a tree of life. There's going to be a Garden of Eden. And... We're going to eat of the fruit of the tree of the tree of life like Adam did. And we're not going to sin. And there's going to be a nation of Hebrew Israelites that are going to, uh, the other nations are going to learn from and they're going to get honor from. And it starts right now with the 144,000 bringing forth the truth, the unvarnished truth, which we're still being, which is still being developed in us even now. Okay. This is the time of the awakening that the Bible has talked about over and over. So in Ezekiel, we know that there's a conversation now between Yahweh the Most High and the children of Israel, the Hebrew Israelites, through, this, in this case, the prophet Ezekiel. And we also, again, I just want to stress, I want to point out that we get this principle of this of this operation of how the most high works with his people in the book of revelation revelation chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2 revelation chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2 again uh revelation i want to show you this is another thing of course you know we are uh coming out most of us of christianity and therefore we're coming out of severe and deep brainwashing severe and deep brainwashing Praise the Most High, yeah. So, because when we looked at this book of Revelation many years, I looked at it through the eyes of a Christian. But now, understanding the 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 chosen Hebrew Israelite people and who they are and why they are, this is looked at completely differently. And let's take a look at these two verses so you can understand a bit by example of what I'm saying. The revelation of Yahweh Shai Messiah, which Yahweh gave unto him to show unto his servants, things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of Yahweh and of the testimony of Yahweh Shai Messiah and of all things that he saw. Okay? Wait a minute. So we can see again. Father is speaking to the Hebrew Israelites, his servants. And he's speaking to them through Messiah, as the Bible says in these last days. He, he says he, he talked to us through many pr prophets. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 that he now, in these last days, speaks to us through his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Right? So, so he has appointed him heir of all things. Praise the Most High God. So... Uh, is everything all right? You guys can hear me, right? Testing one, two, three. Everything okay? You can hear. So he has appointed him heir of all things. And therefore, it says, uh, Yahoo in sundry times and in divers manners spake in time pass unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the world. So he's speaking to us through the Messiah, uh, but he is speaking to us uh, through the Messiah and he gives that message to an angel from the Messiah, and that angel brings it to a human agent. And that person, in this case, was John. In the case of what we're studying in Ezekiel, it's Ezekiel. In the case of these last days, it will be who? Talk to me. It will be who? Who will it be, again, in these last days? Shabbat Shalom. Uh, who will it be in these last days? That's right. He's going to speak to the earth through the 144,000. That's exactly right. That's what's being prepared right now. These people are being prepared. See, brothers and sisters, this is the sign. The sign is not the Pope. I'm not saying the Pope is not in prophecy. Obviously he is. The sign is not the United States of America. No, no. The United States of America is in prophecy, but they're not the sign. The sign is not the United Nations. Yes, they're in prophecy too, but it's not the sign. Well, what is the sign? The sign is the 144,000. The sign is the awakening which precedes the 144,000. Okay? And we can already see the awakening is underway. All of us are being awakened to the things that are happening, the things that really have happened. We are being awakened to the true Hebrew Israelite nation. We're being awakened to what happened to them, where they went, uh, why they went. We're being awakened to them being waken up as to who they are. 
and now being restored to their places as the chosen people of the creator. And so we're seeing it. We're seeing it right in front of us. We're seeing it in, in, in various brothers that are waking up. And I say brothers. Now let me make this, make this very clear, brothers and sisters. Sisters are going to receive the spirit also. The Bible does say they will prophesy as well. They're going to see visions as well. Handmaids will see visions. Israelite handmaids. But make no mistake, and I want you all to understand, the movement is going to be spearheaded through the Most High from the men of the 144,000. We, we need to clearly understand it. And we need to understand very clearly, brothers and sisters, that Babylon is using its culture and its system to pit the brothers against the sisters and the sisters against the brothers. You have to understand... Asatan has been used this divide and conquer tactic for 6,000 years. He actually, he, when he was in heaven and he got kicked out, he used the divide and conquer tactic. So, of course, he's going to use it among us. Of course he is. How do we avoid that? How do we avoid the problem that comes with divide and conquer? Well, first of all, we must make a determination. We are not going to argue and fight with anybody. Testing one, two, three. You catching me? We're not going to argue and fight with anybody. We're not arguing about the scriptures. No, no. You know, first off, you have to understand the scriptures are only uh, valid and true because of the Father's Spirit upon them. And <clears throat> His Spirit bears witness to whoever is connected with His Spirit that what is being said is true from the scriptures. Okay? And, and you know, as you know, and as we've been studying, the, the, the whole concept of witness is very powerful in the Bible. Very important. We become witnesses of the Father's righteousness. Messiah is a witness of the Father's righteousness and holiness. And, and his word is a witness to his truth, to his character, and particularly the covenant. It is a witness to what his character is like, what he's about, what he expects. And when we obey the covenant by his spirit, we become witnesses to the Father's righteousness, to the Father's truth, to the Father's character. So sisters are going to be witness to the Father, but sisters would have to, of course, understand that sisters are created in the image of the man. The man, the Hebrew Israelite man, is created in the image of the Father. Understanding that keeps everything in perspective. So people have their proper respect. You understand? A woman, will, a woman that's a true Israelite, that's truly seeking the Father, will never be found trying to argue and teach with a man. Never be found doing that. No. Because she understands that this, what she's looking at, even if he's ignorant, is of the image of the Father. He may not even understand who he is. And unfortunately, a lot of our brothers don't understand who they are. And unfortunately, as the Bible tells us, there will only be a remnant that will understand. Okay, only a remnant will understand. Okay, everybody understands that. So, so we know that. So most of the brothers you're going to see out here will not ever know who they are. But you still have to respect the brothers. And as brothers, we still respect the sisters because the sisters made in our own image. They made bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. Sisters made bone. So, and the Bible does say very clearly, in fact, let me take a look at me. Let me show you this in Colossians. Let me, let me show you this in the book of Colossians. This is all these brothers that try to lord it over the sisters, try to walk all over them instead of giving them the respect. Notice again, you got to, you know, respect is both ways. It really is both ways. It really is. Okay. In Colossians, let's look at the book of Colossians, a little letter, little epistle from the Hebrew Israelite Shaul, who we call the Apostle Paul. Colossians. No, no, no. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. First off, let's first off. Yeah, Colossians chapter 3. We're going to go to a couple of books here. Colossians chapter 3. Remember, we we coming back to Ezekiel now. Colossians chapter 3. Going to begin at verse 18. Verse 18 and 19, Colossians chapter 3. Notice what it says. Colossians 3, 18 and 19. 
Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as it is fit in your house. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now, as it is fit in the master. What does that mean? That means if you as a virtuous Israelite, Hebrew Israelite or Israelite woman. And your husband and you're submitting to your husband. Suppose your husband say, I need you to go out in the street and sell your body to make us some money. That's not in the master. That's not in your Hawashah. That's not in the father. So he said, as it is fit in the master. You understand? So he, you're not going to do anything. For, your first allegiance is to the father. You respect your husband. But your first allegiance is to the father. You understand? Everybody got that? Now, then it says, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. What does that mean? Be not bitter against them. First of all, I think, I, I, and I think anybody, even people that claim they feminists or whatever, I think anybody clearly understands, everybody clearly understands that men and women are different. Men and women are different. I, I'm not saying anything um, that's, you know, that's new. Men and women are different. I mean, even physically, right? A man is, is put together in a different way than a woman is put together, right? I mean, right? The man is put together differently than a woman. So, so basically, even physically, we can see that these are two different types of human beings. These are not the same type. They might have come, you know, she might have come out of Adam's rib and Adam came from the Most High, but I think we understand That these are two different sets of human beings. And why did I bring that out? Because we are two different sets of human beings. Men tend to get a little bit frustrated with the sisters. Because they sisters. Right? Men tend to get <clears throat> a little bit frustrated with the sisters. Because they sisters. There are things that a sister does. There's things that a sister is. There's just the way she is as a woman. That we got we to gotta respect that. That she's a woman and she's different than you. Don't expect her to... You understand? Don't... Ex, you know what I mean? So you got to have respect that she is a woman. And, and there's blessings in that. Of course. But there's also... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's also development in that. <laughs> There's also development in that. Okay? There's also development in that. So, you know, so don't, uh, yeah, don't, don't uh, be bitter with the sisters. Okay? Pray for that spirit that the Most High will give you that you won't be. Now, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And let's watch this now. First Peter chapter 3. Watch this. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to find the right word. I'm trying to find the right word because I don't want to disrespect the sisters. Okay? And I don't want to puff up the brothers. So look. First Peter chapter 3 verse 7. Notice what it says. First Peter 3 7. Likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Watch this. Giving honor unto the wife. As unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life. Why? That your prayers be not hindered. So if you dishonoring your wife or your woman or any woman, if you dishonoring them, it is possible that your prayers will not be heard. Okay, man? It is so she is supposed to respect you. She is supposed to honor you as being in the image of the Father, but at the same time, you're supposed to respect them. You're not supposed to be bitter against them. You're supposed to give honor and you're supposed to understand they are, the Bible says, the weaker vessel. And you don't want your prayers to be hindered. That was a side note. So I was saying that women are also going to receive prophecy. They're going to receive messages. They're going to receive dreams. It's already happening. But they will never be in a position to teach a man. 
that is not their spot. Okay? They can teach women. They can reveal what the Most High showed them in vision and in dreams to everybody. In fact, it's for everybody. They can teach children. But don't ever put yourself in a position where you are trying to teach a man. And especially today, let me let me just let's let's break this down a minute. In the, in the culture in which we are in, it is West, Western culture. You see, I'm going to say I'm getting ready to say something that uh, you know may not go over well with some people, but I got to speak the truth anyway. In the culture in which we're in, the culture is developed in part to destroy the Hebrew Israelite man, to destroy him. And in trying to destroy him, first they try to degrade him, to make him lower, to make him beg. They want him on the lower scale. Part of the curse it is. And as doing that, they want the even the Hebrew Israelite woman to be against him. And this situation you can see played out in the United States of America because I think we all understand. I don't know how many they are, but you and I know very well there is a large number of single parent homes being led by the woman, by the mother. And I can go into various reasons, but I think we all understand that is the situation. There is a large number of single parent homes being led by the woman. No man there. This is a part of a concerted effort developed by Asatan, okay, to destroy the Hebrew Israelite man. All right, part of a concerted effort to do that. Now, when you have, as we do have in the United States, Three, four generations of women raising men. All right? Therefore, the men end up thinking that the women are their teachers. And they're very comfortable with a woman as their teacher. Perhaps because she had to be because there was no man. But as part of this awakening, that we are now undergoing. We need to understand. I'm not saying the woman shouldn't have tried to raise her son. Or teach her son. What else is she supposed to do? She has to do it. But you have to. As a woman understand. You are raising a child. That you should be telling him. You're going to be the leader. You're going to be the one. You're going to be the one that Yah has created in his image to help lead these last days movies. You got to be telling him that. You got to be uh, teaching him that I am the weaker vessel. I'm your mother. You're going to always respect me because I'm going to beat you behind if you don't. But you go, I'm trying to raise you to be a man. You understand? So because this is what we're dealing with. And as part as of the awakening... Men have to understand that. They have to understand their true place. Now, we cannot expect the brothers. And that's part of the problem in our Hebrew-Israelite community right now with the awakening. A lot of brothers are trying to take the lead and they don't know how to do it because they just they had never had a male instruction and, and, and they don't understand what they're doing. And then you combine that and, and some of them don't read the scriptures properly. And so they, they don't know what they're doing. But you know what? The Bible says very plainly, when my father and my mother forsake me, then Yahweh will pick will take me up. So the spirit of the father will move and is moving on the brothers to teach them what they would never learn from a man because of the way this system is set up. But they never learn from a man because their father wasn't there for whatever reason. Okay? So that's where we are. Now, that brings me to my next point. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You say, man, where is Ezekiel? Well, don't worry. We're getting ready to go there right now. Don't worry about it. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let's start at, um, hmm. I'm going to start at verse 45. 
at 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to start at verse 45, and I'm going to read from verse 45 down to verse 49. Notice what it says. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it the first, oh, excuse me, how be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the master from heaven. As is the earthly, so are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, two Adams it speaks about. A first Adam and a last Adam. And it said the first Adam was earthy. The second Adam was spiritual. The first Adam was of the earth. The second man was from the, the heavens. So wait a minute. What are we talking about? Well, the Bible shows us that Yahawashai is the son of Yahweh. Adam is also the son of Yahweh. In that regard, they're kind of like brothers. The first one is the son of Yahweh, and the second one is the son of Yah. Does that make sense? Testing one, two, three. But the first one we know was created in the image of Yahweh and chose to rebel against him and sinned and, and sinned against him. And, and the spirit from that point on, the spirit of rebellion was has been in all of us. And my wife and I were talking about this this morning. All of us in our earthly natural state have a spirit in us that includes the spirit of rebellion. That's our natural state. It includes a spirit. I don't care how nice you are. I don't care how uh, sweet you are. Within you, there's that spirit. It's there. Come from Adam when he rebelled against the father. It's a spirit. Now, the second Adam also came from the father in the father's image. And he also is of a spirit. But the spirit that he is of is of the father's perfect and holy righteousness. He is of the father's righteousness. Okay? He never sinned. So now, when you're born initially, you are of the first spirit. Okay? And when you are born again, you're of the second spirit. Our first birth from the woman is a descendant of Adam and of Adam's spirit. Our second birth of the father's spirit is through the Messiah. So that there's two Adams and we, if we're going to be saved, we experience two phases. The first phase is our natural phase. The second phase is from the father's spirit. And we are born again. We are born the first time in the flesh. Through a womb. We are born the second time through repentance. Repentance that is a response to conviction from the Father Spirit. Which when we respond positively the Father puts more of his spirit on us. And causes us to be made in his image and character. Does that make sense? Everybody following me so far? And again, that brings me back to the most important doctrine in the Bible, the doctrine of justification by faith. Without this doctrine, there could no flesh be saved. Because let me explain to you. Ezekiel itself, we're going to see very shortly. It says in Ezekiel chapter 18, Ezekiel chapter 18, well, we know the Father doesn't change. And we're going to read 
Oh, we're going to read Ezekiel 18. But notice what it says in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. Ezekiel 18 and verse 4. Notice what the Father is saying to the nation of the Hebrew Israelites through his prophet Ezekiel. He says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. So within us is a spirit of rebellion that's fully set to sin. And we will sin. Okay, that's going to happen. It's the spirit that's in us that we got from Adam. Now, because of that, we're under the death penalty. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. There's only but one penalty for sin. It's death. And brothers and sisters, let me explain to you. When Messiah returns and the father gets to look at this earth straight on without him standing, without Messiah standing before him. Death is going to be reigning because he about to, he going to put it on sin. He expects all of his created beings to be without sin. Somebody say, well, how are we going to be without sin? You see, let me explain how your brainwashed Christians have been taught. Your brainwashed Christians have been taught, we were saved by grace. We don't need to obey anything. There's no commandments to obey. What, you going to be all 600 and something commandments? I heard some fool try to tell me. You're going to be all 615 commandments. First off, when the father made Adam in his own image, Adam was without sin. Father ain't receiving Adam back unless he without sin. But Adam sinned. And so did all his children. How can we lose the sin? Because the father very clearly states through the Messiah the Father clearly states through the Messiah in Revelation chapter 22. He states very clearly in Revelation chapter 22. And uh, let's see, where is that at? Revelation 22 verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So obviously, he's expecting obedience to his commandments if you're going to get into that Hebrew Israelite city called New Jerusalem. So how does this take place? Well, we, that is you and I, when we were born, we didn't have a choice in who our parents were, did we? Like, right? You couldn't choose who your parents were, right? I mean, you didn't, you couldn't decide, oh, I want to be born a Rockefeller, right? Or I want to be born, you know, whoever with, with gazillions of dollars. You know, I want to be born with the silver spoon in my mouth. No, you couldn't. You were born wherever you born and whoever you born by. You can't choose that. But because of Adam, you born with a spirit of rebellion on you. You born with a spirit of sin on you. You did not choose that, but it's on you. And there's a death penalty on you because of it. So Adam's choice to sin caused the curse of rebellion, of the spirit of rebellion to come on all his children. Whether they sinned like Adam did or not. Father said, okay, I checked that out. I see how that worked. So let me do it this way. I'm going to send my son, Messiah, Yahawashah. He's going to also be my son like Adam was. Right? He's going to be without sin like Adam was. Yet he's never going to sin. He's going to be in perfect righteousness the whole time he's on the earth. Therefore, because of that, he should never die because he's without sin. And he wouldn't have. But he allowed himself to be put to death. So that he became the sacrifice. So that now, because of Adam, all Adam's children are in sin. Because of Yahawashah, those that respond to the father's conviction will receive the Father's righteousness. And because Messiah was put to death, the Bible says he became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Yahweh in him. So now Father said, I got a second Adam who is without sin, and because of him, I could put my spirit back on all the children of Adam that want my spirit on them. 
that choose me. That choose me. That choose the things that please me, he says in his word. And what does the Bible say? Well, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear Yah and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Right? Colossians 12. This is the whole duty of man. 13 and 14. So he says, if you would hear my voice and keep my covenant, then you're going to be my people. So now, through Messiah, we can become covenant keepers of the nation of Israel and become his people. Through the Hebrew Messiah, whose blood was shed that that would take place. Therefore, our sin is forgiven us, not because of any good thing that we have done. Because again, I bring up the point, as I said, I was looking at this video a few weeks ago of this brother from New York. This brother was a gangster, a goon. He was a drug dealer. He was out here trying to make it happen. And he was very successful in terms of money-making operations illegally. And in the course of doing that, he killed five people. He murdered five people. Now, he ended up going to jail. And he ended up coming out of jail after, you know, 20 years or whatever. But no matter what he did, no matter how much time he spent in jail, it will not bring back the five people that he murdered. It cannot change the fact that he is a murderer of five people. No matter how many good deeds he does, no matter how many children he teaches, no matter how good he is, it cannot change the fact that he murdered five people. Okay? So how do you get rid of that sin? That's where the Messiah comes in. Messiah takes the penalty of his murder of the five people. As his, when he repents of his sin and confesses his sin on the Messiah. He takes the penalty. And instead of the spirit of a murderer, the father puts the spirit of righteousness on that brother. And that brother now becomes the father's spirit of righteousness. He bears witness to the and bears witness to the Father's spirit of righteousness. He bears not only that, because we understand that we deserve death, he bears witness to the Father's mercy. He bears witness to the true grace of the Father that forgave him his sin and gave him power to now obey the covenant. Okay? So the first Adam sinned and is earthy. And was returned to dust. The second Adam is divine, perfect in righteousness, a witness of the Father's perfect righteous character and of the Father's Spirit. And giveth the Father's Spirit to whomsoever he will, because the Father has given him permission to do that. And those of us of the second Adam, Yahweh Shai, also become witnesses and bear witness to the Father's spirit of righteousness and truth. So that when we're praying, we really, our prayers become very simple, right? We're praying that the Father take from off of us and from out of us the spirit of rebellion, the spirit of sin, the spirit of disobedience, and put within us his spirit of righteousness. That's what we're doing. It's basically come down to that. Praying for ourselves in that regard, our family, our children, friends, acquaintances, whoever that you're impressed by the Spirit to pray for, by the Spirit. So now we're having a spiritual transfusion. The Father is taking the spirit of rebellion and disobedience off of us and putting the spirit of obedience of righteousness on us, which is why whenever we start going to the right hand, to the left, the Bible says, you will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it when you turn to the right and when you turn to the left. Why? Because that is the Father's Spirit telling you, oh, no, no, no. You're getting ready to choose the wrong way, my daughter. You're getting ready to choose the wrong way, my son. No, no, no. Come back to this way. Come back. Come back. Come back. And you and I, we get on our knees. Sorry, Father. My mistake. My bad. I, I was on the wrong path. Praise the Most High. I'm praising you for your mercy again and you're bringing me back again. 
Every time he does that, he is now fortifying us with more of his spirit. And the day is going to come. The day is going to come when we're going to come to him that one last time. And he's going to say, you've come to me enough times now. I'm going to seal you in my spirit. You're never going to turn off the road now. I'm going to seal you in my spirit because you keep coming to me like you want it. So I'm going to give it to you permanently. You're going to have it forever. My spirit is on you. You are holy. Remain holy. You are righteous. Remain righteous forever. Just like the wicked, when they keep being wicked, when they keep turning and they keep receiving the spirit of rebellion and developing the spirit of rebellion. One day he's going to turn around and say, okay, you want, you want the spirit of rebellion? You don't want my spirit anymore? Remain filthy. Remain naked. Remain wretched forever because that's what you want. Okay, that's what you want. Praise the most high. And that's in the book of Revelation. And look again, Revelation chapter, back to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Notice what it says. Um, and I'm going to read verses 10 and 11. Revelation 22, 10 and 11. Notice what it says. This is the very thing we're talking about here. And he says unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. For the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be set apart or holy still. This is the reason you have two groups of people, the people that are seeking him for his spirit of righteousness and seeking to be freed forever from the spirit of rebellion. And the people that are never seeking his righteousness because of their own self-centeredness, they want their own way, they want their own thing. And we're seeing this more and more fully in these last days, people becoming more and more narcissistic. The word, the watchword in these last days is narcissist because a lot of people are becoming self-centered narcissists to the nth degree. It's, it's so prevalent that, that you can't like, there's so many that it's hard to find somebody that's not narcissistic. The self-centeredness is so prevalent. That's why you have people killing their own families, killing themselves, killing everybody. They not. They only care about how they think, what they feel about things. They don't care about how it affects anybody else. Only how it affects them. That's that's narcissism in the extreme. That's where we are. That's where we are today. You see, the difference between the two groups, aside from the obvious, is. The one that's receiving the righteous spirit is concerned with how the father feels. They're concerned with what, with what they do, how it makes the father look. They're concerned with, 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 with how the father looks upon them. That's their ultimate aim and concern. But the other is concerned with what they think. Concerned with how they feel. Concerned with what they want it to look like. Okay? That's the difference. When you have the Father's Spirit, that is the Spirit of Messiah, who, the Bible says, gave himself for our sins. Why? Because he, he, every time they talk to Messiah, you read, you read it in the Gospels, Matthew and Mark, Luke and John. I'm only doing what my Father told me to do. I'm only speaking the words that my Father gave me to speak. I am only came to bear witness of my Father. That's what he kept saying. Everything you see me do, I learn from my father. That's all, that's, that's all Messiah kept saying. Right? So that's the difference because we come from that same cloth, that same spirit. And so we're looking to see what is the father, how are we going to give him the glory? How are we going to get glory to him? And he has already told us, if you love me, keep my commandments. Your whole duty is to, is, to, is to keep my commandments. Blessed are they that keep my commandments. And we understand to obey his commandments, statutes, and judgments, we need his spirit. His spirit of righteousness to take possession of us and to seal us. And we individually ask for that. And as we individually ask for that, when we meet each other, right? We meet each other. That same spirit that's on you is on me. And we connect in one because the Spirit is the Father's. Praise the Most High, Yah. 
and we praise him and we and we hug and we can be brothers and sisters that we have never met before because of the same spirit. Yes, Yah is the only one who gets the glory. It's all about his honor and glory. And that's why the Bible says we are soldiers for the Messiah. See, a soldier is only caring about carrying out the orders of his commander. Isn't that correct? A, a, a good soldier is only trying to carry out orders from his commander. He don't care how uncomfortable it is. He don't care how dangerous it is. He don't care if he's going to lose his life. A soldier is seeking to carry out the instructions of his commander, his orders. We have our orders to reflect, to reflect, to bear witness to the Father's righteousness. And so everything we do is uh, according to that. Praise the Most High. So now we see we have two phases of us. Two phases. The first phase, we were born of Adam. The second phase, born of the Messiah, Yahweh Okay? Also, more specifically, of the nation of Israel. There are two phases. There are two phases of the nation of Israel. There's the initial phase that was born of the flesh that came out of Mizraim, out of Egypt, right? We read Ezekiel, uh, uh, Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, uh, uh, 2, uh, 3, let's go from Exodus 20 from verse 1, actually, let's go from verse 1 to, to 4. Notice what it says. And Allah Yim spake all these words, saying, I am Yahweh, thy most high, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other Allah Yim before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So he first tell us he is the Most High that brought you Hebrew Israelites out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now we know what happened. Our fathers were brought out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. They were given commandments, statutes, and judgments to obey, right? We know that. And we know they rebelled against the Most High. First of all, their rebellion was such a, a trip that even on foot would have taken a matter of maybe weeks to complete from Egypt to the promised land. Matter of weeks, right? Uh, even for a million plus strong coming through the desert, matter of weeks for them to make this trip by foot to the most, took them 40 plus years, the, the time they were messing up, and then 40 years after that, because of their rebellion. Then they get into the land, and they're in the land, and they start worshiping other gods. They start worshiping other entities. They start wanting to be like the nations instead of teaching the nations the way of the Most High Yah, and they failed in their mission. But, as we're going to read in Ezekiel, praise the Most High Yah, and as all the prophets have stated, and as we know, even Moses stated it, Isaiah stated it, um, David stated it, uh, Zechariah stated it, Ezekiel stated it, Jeremiah stated it, the prophets all speak with one voice. What are they saying? Let's take a look. Let's just use a couple of witnesses to this. Let's use a couple of witnesses, a couple of the prophets as witnesses. And we're, let's look at Yeshia, otherwise known as Isaiah, uh, chapter 11. And uh, let's take a look at this. We're talking about the second phase here. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11. Notice Isaiah 11. I'm going to begin... From verse, let's see, uh, from verse 10, we're going to read down to verse 20. We could read the whole chapter, but let's just for sake of time, from verse 10 to verse 20. Y'all still can hear me, right? Testing one, two, three. You guys can still hear me, right? I want to make sure. Okay. All right. Let's go. In the, and in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh shall set his hand again, the second time, 
to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Mizraim and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Amoth and from the isles of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Yashar'al and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west, they shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. And Yahweh shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea with his mighty wind. Shall he shake his hand over the river and smite it in his seven streams and make men go over dry shot. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day when he, that he came up out of the land of Egypt. So we can see the first time they came up, they got into the land. They banished the, the uh, Canaanites, but they didn't keep the land because of disobedience. But the second time, there's going to be no third time. The second time they're going to take the land, it's going to be covered with righteousness and knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. And He's going to take his Hebrew Israelite people from all over the earth and bring them. Let's take another look at this in Jeremiah chapter 23. Another witness, Jeremiah chapter 23, bearing witness to the same thing in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. Jeremiah chapter 23. Uh, from verse 3. Let's go down from verse 3 down to verse 8. Watch very carefully. Jeremiah chapter 23 from verse 3 to 8. Notice what it says. I will gather the remnant of my flock. This is the Most High speaking now through his prophet Jeremiah or Jeremiah. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith Yahweh. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved. And Yashar Al shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called. Yahweh, our righteousness. Or Yahweh, Sadak, praise the Most High. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that they shall no more say, Yahweh liveth, which brought up the children of Yashar Al out of the land of Egypt. But Yahweh liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Yashar Al, out of the north country, and from all the countries whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. There it is. Witness number two. Yes, it's all given. Wait a minute. It said in the mouth of two or three. I could stop at two, but I have to give you all a third one. So we got... Isaiah as a witness. We got Jeremiah as a witness. Ezekiel is going to be a witness, so we'll save him for later. Ezekiel is going to be a witness. We got Jeremiah Zechariah as a witness as well. But let's go back to my brother, our elder brother, the brother, the leader, the, the teacher, the first teacher, Moses. Let's go back and get his witness. Deuteronomy, Adabarim, these be the words, chapter 30. Y'all know where I'm going. The chapter of the awakening. Chapter 30 from verse 1 to 10. The chapter of the awakening. Notice what it says. And it shall come to pass. When all these things are come upon thee. The blessing and the curse. Which I have set before thee. And thou shalt call them to mind. 
among all the nations where the Yahweh thy Most High has driven thee, and shalt return unto Yahweh thy Most High, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thy heart and with all thy soul, that then Yahweh thy Most High will turn thy captivity, and will have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations where the Yahweh thy Most High has scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will Yahweh thy Most High gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And Yahweh thy Most High will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it. And he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And Yahweh thy Most High will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed to love Yahweh thy Most High with all thy heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. And Yahweh thy Most High will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of Yahweh and do all his commandments which I command thee this day. And Yahweh thy Most High will make thee plenteous in every work of thy hand, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land for good. For Yahweh will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. If thou hearken unto the voice of Yahweh thy Most High, to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto Yahweh thy Most High with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Praise the Most High Yah. Yes, brothers and sisters. The, the prophets speak with one voice. He's going to restore Israel. He's going to restore the nation. And, and, and let, me, let me speak very clearly here. This is no replacement theology. Somebody might say, what is replacement theology? I, you know what? I hesitate to even, to even bring it up because it's so foolish. But the Christians preach this, this replacement theology where they, where they believe they, they pagan denominations is taking the place of the nation of Israel. Well, let me ask you. Are the pagan denominations that are taking the place of the nation of Israel, are they the ones that were scattered all over the earth by the Most High because of their disobedience? Are they the ones whose fathers were killed and be, because of their disobedience? Are they the ones that represent Judah and Israel that came through the, the Egyptian sea? No. Now we know this replacing theology is pure garbage. Unfiltered, unvarnished foolishness. The Most High has not cast off the people that he foreknew. We already have stated from the scriptures. A Hebrew Israelite is a Hebrew Israelite by bloodline. You cannot be a Hebrew Israelite by faith. You can become an Israelite by faith. You can be grafted into the Israelite nation by faith. Yes, you can. But you cannot become a Hebrew Israelite unless you are of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? And the Messiah clearly said, I came not. I came not, he said, but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, some of them might say, well, didn't Messiah, didn't Messiah walk out of the temple and say, your house is left unto you desolate? Yes, he did. But again, we're talking about the first manifestation, the first phase of the Israelite nation, just like the first phase of Adam and just like the first phase of us. So the Israelite nation rebelled against the Most High, second phase through the Hebrew Israelite Messiah is first going to hit his chosen people and bring them back in his spirit to be one with the Father. And that is already happening. So there's no replacement for them. There's no replacement for them. And all these people preaching this replacement theology, they're going to have to answer to the Father for being imposters. For trying to be imposters and represent his people when they do not. Just as the Ashkenazi say they are Jews and are not, so do these people who preach this replacement theology and think that they're going to be Israelites when they're not. 
The Father has not cast off his people that he foreknew. Praise the Most High Yah. Amen. So the prophets speak with one voice. We saw that there's two of us, Adam first, Adam second. There's two nations of Israel. Well, let me tell you, there's two Jerusalems as well. There's two Jerusalems as well. And just with us, like with Adam, <laughs> it's just powerful, man. Let, let me explain. So when Adam sinned against the Most High, right, he tried to cover himself up, right? He, he, he saw that he was naked and he tried to cover himself up. He got some fig leaves and he tried to cover himself up with the fig leaves. And, and the father ended up killing an animal and giving Adam, you know, some proper clothes made out of leather, some skins to wear, okay? So that's very powerful because Adam is trying to cover up his own sin with his own self, right? He himself trying to, trying to cover his sin. And that's what we do when we try to to, to render some sort of obedience or become religious without the Father's Spirit, we're like Adam trying to cover himself with the fig leaf. But the Father provided for Adam skins of animals and for his wife, and they wore the skins of Adam. He killed an animal, making sure that we understand now, because of the sacrifice, you are going to be covered from your nakedness. Because of Messiah's sacrifice, we are going to be covered from our nakedness. Right? So man tried his best in the early stage to cover himself and it didn't work. In Israel as a nation, they tried various forms of, of uh, you know, you'd get a righteous king, you'd get a wicked king, and they kept going back and forth. They tried, it, it didn't work, and they ended up being destroyed. The second Adam, Messiah, came, and the perfect righteous of the Father being coming through him now causes all that receive him to become witnesses, we stated, of the Father's righteousness through the Messiah. Now, also now, Israelite as a nation is going to, through the same Messiah, Yahweh, our righteousness, is now going to now also bear witness as a nation of the Father's perfect righteousness in the kingdom of the new Jerusalem, which brings me to what we're talking about in Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16 starts off talking about Jerusalem. And it talks about how the Father found Jerusalem. Now, we have already read, in the book of Deuteronomy, we have already read where the Father says, with regard to the land that is the land of Canaan, that his eye is always on that land. We read that in the book of Deuteronomy. His eye is always on that land. From year to year, even before Moses was born, even before they came through, he said his eye is always on that land. He has picked that land for his chosen people and for the capital of the nation and of the kingdom that is coming. So he's picked that. So now he notices how Jerusalem was when he first when we first got there, when he brought the people there. Notice again Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16 from verse 1 from verse 1 down to verse 6. Ezekiel 16 from 1 to 6. Again, the word of Yahweh came unto me saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. And say, Thus saith the Most High Yahweh unto Jerusalem. Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite and thy mother a Hittite. As for thy nativity, in the day that thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thy own blood, I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. Praise the Most High. So Jerusalem was in the land of Canaan, or Canaan. When the Israelites came there, it was occupied by Jebusites. And then in the city of Jerusalem was called Jebus at first. 
but they changed it to Jerusalem, which means city of peace. And it was called Jebus because it was controlled by the Jebusites. So they took it over. Now, the Most High in his grace and mercy had Solomon build a temple and said, I'm going to put my name there and dwell there. And he did. But there's no other earthly temple made with hands that the Father is dwelling in. He does not dwell in temples made with hands. See, again, when you start seeing people putting a lot of money into a building, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you to be careful. The pagans do that. That's what they did with Dagon. We don't need no big fancy building, brothers and sisters. The synagogues that the Israelites would, would worship in was nondescript buildings. It was very plain buildings. And it was in the, the, the town in which they lived because they, everybody was in walking distance. So they had synagogues in walking distance because not everybody could go to Jerusalem every Sabbath. So they had synagogues in the towns, in the villages, in the, uh, in, in the tribes where people could walk to. But they were not, it was not about the building because they wanted in no way to have anybody think that they would be, you know, actually giving any honor to that building. They came there to study the scriptures and to give praise to the Most High. They did not sit down in these buildings. They stood up. The men stood up in the main area and the woman stood up behind the screen in the back. And it wasn't all day they did this. They prayed, they read the scriptures. They expound it, the men, and then they go home, walking distance from the synagogue. But we done got carried away with these big buildings we trying to build. You know what I'm saying? See, brothers and sisters, I told my wife this the other day. I want to make sure you hear me. Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me? Testing one, two, three. I want to make sure you're here this now. Listen. Brothers and sisters, most of us coming out of Christianity have been brainwashed. I'm just going to be straight with you. You know I am. We've been brainwashed. And the brainwashing is very deep. Okay? And what I want to say to you is, it's going to take us years to overcome it. The Most High is working with us. His Spirit is working in our hearts as we allow Him to. To cause us to overcome this deep brainwashing that we've had in this Christian religion. Now, we have to be careful. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of what I'm saying. When I was younger, I had certain habits. Like I would talk to my girlfriend and without thinking about it, I would start to undress her and get ready to have sex with her without even thinking about it. Sometimes I even did it in my sleep. It was so natural. It happened so quickly. Like I just wasn't even thinking. I just wasn't even thinking like that. So then when I became a Christian, right, I wanted to not do that anymore. I didn't have control of it. I prayed. And one day, uh, my wife now, my wife is with me. She's a different woman. She's a Christian woman. She's trying to be, you know, she's a virtuous woman. And I found myself starting to do it. I wasn't even thinking. And I caught myself though. Praise the most high. Caught myself. And I said, oh, shoot. We don't want to do that. And that caused me to pray and fast to, to, to overcome that. Because that was a spirit that was controlling me. Praise the Most High. So, with Christianity in general, sometimes we do things because we did it as Christians and we don't know any other way to do it and we just move in that direction without thinking about it. We have we treat the teacher as if he's a pastor and the pa and his wife as if she's a first lady. Don't we do that? That comes from the churches, man. That's not Hebrew Israelite. That's not Hebrew Israelite. But that's what we used to doing. Oh, we want to honor the teacher and his wife, you know, first lady with this or that. That's not Hebrew Israelite. You never read that in the scriptures. We never read where Moses is one, either of his wives was first lady. Yeah, but it's Christian and we get that from Christianity and we start to think that out of, you know, out of our habits. And then many such things happen like that because of our Christian backgrounds. So what we need to pray for the Father to do is continue to send his spirit on us so that we will not look to paganism, which what Christianity as we know now is paganism. We do not look to paganism. For how we do things. 
but to the word of the Most High alone, right? So we got to be careful how we conduct ourselves. And a lot of times when we want a building, people want to get a building. Okay, go get a building, but be careful. Don't start thinking that building is the Yah's temple or anything. It's just a nondescript building that y'all going to meet in. That's all. It's not the house of the Lord. It's not. Okay? There's only but one temple. It was Solomon's temple. That's destroyed. We now become the temple, our temple. If we treated our bodies in the spirit and in the flesh the way he wants us to, you know, that's, that's, that's really where he wants to dwell in our bodies. And the next temple we're going to see is the new Jerusalem coming down from Yah out of heaven. You see, he saw this one. He said, live. And he brought his people there and it became Jerusalem and he fixed it up and it became holy. And he brought his temple there and he had his Shekinah glory go into that temple. And, he, and it became the place and they had feast there. They did the feast of uh, Passover there with the unleavened bread. They did the feast of weeks there. They did the feast of the tabernacles there. They had... The, the, the Day of Atonement did. They, they did it. But then they started messing up. So that's what he's talking about now. He's talking about Jerusalem. Now, again, I want to stress the fact that the, the Most High equates the 144,000 and the city of Jerusalem as his bride. Because the city is the place where the 144,000 will dwell with the Father and with Messiah. So he equates them both as his bride. People get that confused because uh, in Revelation 19, it shows the righteousness of the saints as his bride. And then, of course, uh, in Revelation chapter 21, we see this. He says, come see the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he's looking at the city and everybody gets confused. Which one is it? It's both. It's the 144,000. In the New Jerusalem. So just here, he's talking about Jerusalem, the city, right? And he's saying, live. What he's really talking about is not just the brick and mortar. He's talking about the people inside the city. Y'all follow me? So he's saying, you know, y'all was, this is what was living there. Filth, Gentiles was living there. And we, and, we, and we caused it to live. We brought the Israelite, we brought the Hebrew nation, the holy nation to the most high in that place. And, and, and we brought the Shekinah glory in that place. And now it was holy to the most high. See, he says, live. Okay? Praise the Most High, yeah. Amen. Okay. Um, I'm going to read a little bit more and then we're going to stop. I want to read a little bit more because we haven't been here for a week, basically. Um, I'm going to read from verse 7. I'm going to read from verse 7 down to verse 14. From verse 7 to verse 14. And we'll stop there. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field. And thou hast increased and waxing great. And thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned. And thy hair is grown. Whereas thou wast naked and bare. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee. Behold thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee. And covered thy nakedness. Yea. I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee and said, the, says the Most High Yahweh, and thou becamest mine. You see, that's how we get married in Hebrew Israelite world. We don't um, sign papers and, and, and exchange vows. We make a covenant to keep covenant with the Most High. The woman make a covenant to obey her husband and he make a covenant to honor the wife. That's as simple as that. Isn't that? That's not complicated. Like we gotta write our own stuff because the most high he's because if you're married, you're getting married, you should be marrying a Hebrew Israelite or an Israelite, you should be getting married to an Israelite. And if you're marrying an Israelite, you are both have covenanted by the blood baptism in the water and by the Father's Spirit to keep covenant with the Most High. So when he says here, I covered my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness and swear unto thee and entered into a covenant. Okay. When a man to the covenant, remember the Bible says he's supposed to provide her full raiment duty of marriage. Okay? She's living in his house, provide full raiment duty of marriage. That's what he's supposed to do. And of course, he's supposed to honor her as well. And she's supposed to submit herself to him uh, as she would submit to the Most High. As he is in the Most High. Praise the Most High, yeah.
very serious thing, marriage thing, very serious thing. If we took it as seriously as it was, if we really did, as, as Israelites, you know, there wouldn't be divorces and stuff. You wouldn't have that. You'd have people that were brought together by the Spirit or not brought together at all. You see, we should take that in mind, praise the Most High. So he said, he said, he swear unto them and he made a covenant right there and he spread his skirt over her. That means he did what he did, you know, he consummated the marriage. By his spirit, praise the Most High. Verse 9, Then washed I thee with water, yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger's skins, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. Ooh, he was treating this sister nice, right? I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands and a chain upon thy neck. You know, when we were in the Adventist church, remember? You're not supposed to wear any jewelry. Wait, wait. He, 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 he said, he decked her out, right? He said, I, 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 I put ornaments on you. I put bracelets on your hands. I put a chain on your neck. I put a jewel in your forehead, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown upon thy head. And thou wast decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was as fine linen and silk embroidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful. So that so, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom, and thy renown. No, that's it. Yeah, one more, yeah. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, said the Most High Yahweh. Now, I don't want the sisters to think you're going to get all gaudy, right? This is not for y'all to be getting gaudy and throwing all kind of gold on yourself. All right, don't do that. The Bible does say you're supposed to be modest. So make sure you stay modest. Okay, I'm not saying you can't wear these things. The Bible clearly is stated otherwise, but... Be, it also tells us, sisters, you need to be modest. First Peter tells you, you need to be modest. Don't, don't, don't start, you know, tripping out and going all crazy with this stuff. Okay, be modest with it. Be cool with it. Be clean with it. Okay. All right. The Spirit will show you how to do that. But he, he dressed her up, gave her the finest food, and the renown of her, that is Jerusalem, went among the heathen. See, so he had intended. That Jerusalem was going to be the capital. His people and the renown of what he had done for them. In terms of not just bringing them out of the land of Egypt. But giving them his law. And, and creating a, a whole constitution. Giving them statutes, commandments and judgments in terms of that. And teaching them how to deal with each other. In righteousness and truth. And teaching them most of all also. Along with uh, obedience to the father. Teaching them how to take care of the poor. How to take care of the poor. Taught them all of that. And that was the beauty that was the, the, supposed to be the nation. We're going to see what happened after that tomorrow. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happened after that tomorrow. But um, yeah, praise the most high. Yeah.